Hey guys, Christopher Marlowe again. Uh, this is a remake of an older video that I had back in 2019 on the channel here. I was going to re-upload that original video with better volume, because I guess I was too quiet. You guys in the comments were, have been pointing that out to me. But I didn't want to like download, rip the download from YouTube and then fiddle with it there, because, you know... I figured the quality might go down, and I could not actually access the original files, so here we are. And I have a couple of subtle improvements, I guess, in the workflow, and maybe even the, the sound, but I wanted to keep it kind of brief and to the point, so here we go. Before I go into the method, I just wanted to give you a sound demo. So this is what the prismizer effect will sound like. Go. The oak tree Walking beside me Beside me Buried in scarlet Without the choir? Tumbled in sand Unto the oak tree, the roots for hands. And there we go. This is the prismizer effect, so called, but yeah, auto tune choir is more descriptive. First, we had the lead vox, and I've just put some retune on that. God is the oak tree. It's sort of a bit of a weird kind of wonky effect because the formants aren't being corrected very uh, extremely. Uh, I'm using the Pro 333 Pro and Preserve Formants High Pitches 10 milliseconds, but that's up to you um, and what you're going for. So one difference here between this this particular method and the original method that I uploaded is I'm actually duplicating this vocal um, on another track. So that, like I think you should be able to do that with Command or Control D on your keyboard. Control on Windows, Command on Mac. Uh, don't quote me on that, because I've added a lot of things from my own. But on this duplicate track here, and I'll explain why I have the duplicate afterwards. But for now, we'll just go with it. <laughs> um, I have another instance of retune on this duplicate. I've called this calibration. That will become sort of clear in a minute. But as to, as to why I'm doing that, but this is really short, so three milliseconds. You can play with that, see if it makes a difference for you, but um, not super important. Just that it's pretty extreme. And I'm using the soloist. I didn't have that in the previous video, but I don't mind it in, in this one. Uh, now, we're not using automatic for this one. We're going to go over to the manual correction tab. And if I zoom out with the, the minus button here. Oh, actually, okay, well, let me let me do this from the beginning. So. I delete this line. What we're going to do is we engage their manual correction, make sure track pitch is on, and also, yeah, octave shifts. That's the other one that we need. So if we clear this, um, one more thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the routing for this track too. Turn off the master send. Uh, that way we can mute this from our from our output output. Uh, but still be able to send it to other tracks, which which we're going to do. Um, that's another change from the from the last video. But okay, so we just go to the beginning of our project, and we have track pitch. And we just play oh, through it here. If I solo this, we won't hear anything. But what we will do is we'll get this little series of red lines, and it's just tracking the pitch over over. Uh, the various vocal phrases, and you can see the line is is representing the timeline uh, cursor. So we're already over halfway done here. And if you if you ever um, change where the vocal is on your timeline, you're gonna have to redo this because it doesn't this doesn't remember your uh, any changes you make here, any correction that you do on the the manual tab. So. The only reason I do this is so I can find the middle ground, approximately. It's just sort of a, an, an, an estimation, but 
Uh, yeah, I think so. What I've been doing is D3 because that's to me that's sort of a little bit like a midpoint between the, the, the lowest pitch and the highest pitch. Um, it doesn't matter inherently what, what note you choose. But one, oh, one thing you do want to remember is if you have your vocal going all the way to the middle, you want to drag this, this uh, end point all the way past your, uh, your note names here, your little piano roll here. Uh, otherwise, you'll have a little bit at the beginning, possibly, that is not being corrected, um, like here, for example. Yeah, I've fallen into that trap, so I hope you don't. <laughs> um, that's why I mention it. Um, so now what we're doing... But yeah, you can't hear anything now if, you've, if we're doing this right. But we're going to send this, if I just delete this, I'm, all I did was I just took the routing, click and drag to this third track. I've called this choir. Post fader is fine. Um, but this is where our actual auto-tune choir effect will, will live. Oh, but just uh, for your edification, if we turn master send back on, for the this calibration track, and we listen to it. God is the oak tree. That's what you want it to sound like. Now, always this is the one note. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, we'll turn the master send off. Now, for the choir, if we don't have any mini data, MIDI data, sorry, <laughs> got to enunciate, and we just have this muted, and and we have this soloed, we're not going to hear anything. But what we need on this track is an instance of re-voice. This is the only thing that you need, like, bare minimum-wise. Bare, bare minimum, minimum-wise. Uh, dry at muted all the way to infinity, minus infinity, wet at unity, or you can, you know, adjust that. Um, max voices, I usually have it all the way up to eight, because why not? Attack and release mm, might help I don't, I don't usually end up fiddling with them but if you get clicks you might it might help hard to say uh so now the, the important thing about this is is two 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 settings here one is the center note this note needs to be exactly the same as our calibration retune so here i have d3 octave three and a d pitch and that's what I have here. So you're going to have to just sweep through this until you find your the right, you know. In this case, it's the 50th note. So, or you can type in the number of the note. Uh, I don't type in D3. Um, I don't think that works, but anyway. So the other setting is, I like to use the rubber band library algorithm at this stage. That's sort of a, just a preference, a sound preference. And I like to preserve formants. That helps, I think. I have a mix, transients, per percussive detector. I don't know. Uh, you can fool with that if, if you're not happy with the sound. But yeah, so now we feed it MIDI chord information. And the yeah, so if we solo this now. Tree. Those are the notes that are being played. So now, uh, if we add in, say, I'll talk about this in a minute as well. But uh, this is one of my favorite chorus effects. It's also free, and it's stereo. The stereo part is why I like it. Um, so what we get now is a. Yeah, sort of a nice stereo effect. It doesn't doesn't really lose any volume when you uh, listen in mono. So awesome. And I like to clean that up a little bit with this side pass plugin. It's just a high pass on the side frequencies, which is a common sort of mix technique, but um, or or mastering. But it's just one little plugin for it. It's one and done. Adjust the cutoff, and then there you are. You can use any mid-Z EQ for this as well, but... This is quite easy for, for me to kind of, you know, get a handle on. Um, that's it. Uh, and then we just have that along with the Levox. 
Because the oak tree. There you go. So that's the whole video. Uh, that is not actually the whole video. Apologies. I s said that I would talk about this uh, automation line here in a, in a second, and I never did. So I'm just inserting this in. This is for uh, repitch, and specifically the form and shift full parameter. This is a really, really powerful tool because it gives you kind of a, a really precise manual uh, control here over your formants. And it's just an audio, it's just a processor, so it, it'll just affect... Um, what I like to do is 333 Pro. Um, because I, I know that that one does a shift formants it, as it says here note formant adjustment not supported with all modes this one I believe always will you know adjust your formant for you but the cool thing is you don't have to be shifting the pitch at all to, to use this tool it's just a it'll just adjust whatever you know is whatever's coming into it so what I've done is I've made an automation lane by uh, selecting the track, hitting the letter T on the keyboard, that engages the, uh, I believe it's the touch automa um, automation mode, and, and here we have this now. Oh, I, I, I can actually try that from the beginning. So if we, if we move a parameter, there we go. Instant uh, lane in the track view, and... Uh, select the track and T again, that'll get rid of the touch mode. That's a good idea to do. You can get kind of uh, in some trouble if you accidentally leave that on. So now the reason why you might want to have some format adjusting, uh, manually speaking, is because I used to like to use, for, um, for example, I think I have this already prepared here. Uh, yeah, I like to use sometimes this, this Pro. Uh, because in the past, I was trying to uh, compromise between this soloist mode, which is really, really sharply uh, correcting the formants, but it leaves you with this sort of grainy, sandy kind of um, flavor in in the audio. It's not. It's really, really bad, especially when you're doing it in two stages, and both stages are soloist. So I I try to get around that by using something like Pro, which is relatively CPU efficient. Uh, the rubber band library can get pretty CPU heavy, which is why I didn't used to always like using it. Now I'll just put it on and freeze the whole track just, you know, to get around that. But if you're like me and you, at some point, you know, you wanted to use the Pro, at least in the past I did, this is really nice because it doesn't give you that sandy, grainy processed, processed um, sound. But instead what you get is really wild uh, swings in formant. And actually, I think it'll uh, it'll happen especially if you, not, um, not necessarily just if you have Pro here, but if you also use the, the Pro algorithm on the calibration stage, then you'll really get the crazy formants. Um, you'll get like chipmunks and then monsters, scary monster sounds. Um, so, and I can show you. So it's like it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, for even from it's all over the place from voice to voice, so it's kind of um kind of chaotic if you, if you if you do have this but if you really had your heart set on this and you want to just kind of manually sort of precisely manipulate the the formant what you can do is you can do this thank you you have this just sort of full range of control so if you thought that was a little bit too low in the formant you can push it up. Push this up more, maybe. Yeah, 
It can get crazy, so I don't I don't really necessarily recommend, especially not at the calibration stage. I have found soloists is pretty good. But yeah. So and part of the reason why I didn't like to use to use the soloist even on this is because it's if you have it pretty bone dry when you duplicate the with the choir, you know, layers, it can start to be a little more audible. But the thing is I think honestly that this this multiply choir, I mean choir chorus effect, it sort of softens everything out. Uh, if you want to stick around, I will kind of mention why this is even a thing and why I, uh, you know, different reasonings for things. But if if you're interested in the method behind what I'm doing, then I will go into that in a second. But uh, yeah, just to kind of keep the time down for <laughs> those of you who are in in a rush or or don't have time. Uh, yeah, I've been. Yeah, that's that's. I'm Christopher Marlowe, and like, subscribe, share the video whatever uh anything like that helps the channel so that's that's awesome and um thanks to the few of you who have already subscribed love it y'all are fantastic um but yeah so if you're still around <laughs> um this is what sort of led me to this i i was really obsessed with this you know a couple years ago or even a few years ago i don't uh it's been sort of a long time in the making but i listened to i want to say like the, what is it, 33 or 20, 22 Creeks or something by Bon Iver where he, it's just, just the prismizer effect on his voice and that's like the whole song. Very kind of minimalistic, but that's not I, that's not like the first place it's been used, I don't think, but it's, it was where I kind of uh, became a convert to this sort of thing, because it's not a vocoder, but it's just that it sounds weird, but new and different. Um, and that, I believe, uses the Antares Harmony engine which is still a thing, I think, but maybe under a slightly altered name. I'm not sure. I wanted to be able to do it in Reaper, like which is with the tools I had, because the, the plugins were kind of expensive, and I still don't have them, but I knew there was this, this plugin called Revoice, but it, it was always kind of frustratingly... Um, how do I say? Like, uh, uh, just, yeah, a little bit... Lim not quite working the way I wanted it to because it's sort of like these uh, these old guitar harmonizer or, or pitch shifter pedals, for example, where you have like a fixed interval and it, it fixes the intervals around this center note. and But, but the, the pitches just depend on what, what you're feeding into it. So the only way I'm able to get this to work in a sort of a, a pitch locked sense, like where if you play a C anywhere on the, key, on the MIDI keyboard, it will give you a C in that octave, is if we force the incoming audio into one specific note and just feed that by itself into the, the revoice. And that's why there's that calibration stage. And it, I, I think it, it, it means we have to process the sound a little bit more than you might have to if this was all baked into revoice, because it, it, it would probably it would be able to, I think kind of lock it into place with just one stage of, of pitch correction, where in this case we have two, but here we are. So this And this is a pretty good, I think, workaround for the limitations here in the plugins. But uh, it's also mono, but a nice stereoizing effect kind of works nicely, uh, or, or any kind of um, spatial processing. Um, let's see. So the, the other thing is I'm duplicating the tracks, which <laughs> might seem like... A little bit pointless um but it there is a reason for it so in the in the original tutorial i only had this one lead vox sending sending the signal to, to this track here but this track didn't have any uh, audio items on it. it just had uh you know nothing and it was just processing the incoming audio with another stage of retune and then sending that to the choir um, which works, however, what that means, if you um, if you think about the signal flow, you actually get, for the original, you're just having the one vocal signal, and that's getting three stages of pitch shifting applied to it. And so that's, that's a lot of very kind of, and sometimes very intensive processing, 
particularly with these two stages. And so by duplicating it here, we're sort of cutting down this to only two stages here. And we're processing the lead vox on its own, just with its own stage. So there's still a lot of processing, but it's not all happening to the same signal. So there's slightly, slightly less, less degradation, in th at least in theory, of, of the signal. Um, that's, that's, you know, whether it really makes a, an appreciable difference in the mix, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, so that's pretty much that. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, I hope this was helpful in some way. And I hope you can get something out of it, or maybe at least some ideas, springboards for other, other, uh, creative, um, possibilities for these, these, uh, these plugins and, and Reaper and anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, thank you so much guys once again, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.